Welcome. This is the podcast of Care Austria with Andrea Bastoff Hager. Welcome to our Care in Action podcast. My guest today is Dr. Milita Sunic. Welcome to Care Austria. Thank you for having me. And as always, uh, I will do a short introduction of today's guest. Milita Sunic was born in 1955. She studied journalism and political science and was press spokesperson and senior communication expert at the UN High Commissioner for Refugees for 20 years. So you are a PR person, a media expert, and you came to Austria yourself in 1957 as a refugee child from former Yugoslavia in those days. So you were a small child, you came with your family, Do you still have memories on that? Uh, not of arriving, uh, not of the very first days. I was one and a half years old. But of living in a refugee camp, I do. We lived in a refugee camp until I was um, 10 years old. And then we moved to the first flat, which was, by the way, provided by UNHCR. And I still remember how proud I was every day I came home from school that I came home to a normal address, a street and a street number and the door number, and not this and this camp, this and this barrack, this and this room. It was a stigma that I had with me wherever I had to say my address or whoever looked at my, at my background knew where I came from. Whereas at the age of 10, for the first time, I experienced a normal address and being like the others, and that was a great thing. So it's very interesting that you mentioned that because I'm quite sure that nearly nobody thinks about that. When we talk today about the camps like Treskirchen, for example, which is a lot in the media or other refugee camps, uh, that also your own perception of how you feel yourself has a lot to do whether you have an address or not. Uh, I can even tell you an experience about emails. Uh, the University of Vienna had a project for refugees that started in, in 2015, refugee students or people who had studied and needed to have their diplomas recognized. So these people could enroll in special integration courses at the University of Vienna. I was involved in that. And one of the real great features for them was that they got an email address with Uh, University of Vienna handled. Mm -hmm. And that was just, that gave them back some of the dignity, some mm -hmm. of their previous lives. So these small things matter. Mm -hmm. Has a lot to do with your self-esteem, but also with the perception, how you are perceived by other, by Absolutely. your surroundings and by other people. Yeah, Absolutely. And how you think you're being perceived. Mm -hmm. So perception is something that will follow us through this uh, conversation. I mean, let's stay a little bit uh, at the personal side because it's always very interesting to look also at the background from where people come who really become professional experts in the field of international cooperation, refugee work uh, in their later lives. Um, so you came from Rijeka, a city that many Austrians know quite well because we love to, to, to go on holiday to Croatia. Many have uh, relatives. Um, can you, for our, especially for our younger audience, can you summarize briefly why did you have to flee back then in 57? Well, my father actually had to flee. He was a politically very engaged person. And at that time, uh, Yugoslavia was not the liberal, relatively liberal country it was in the 60s. At that time, it was still quite... Stalinist and communist within the country. They had broken with Stalin, yes, but within the country the system was still very rigid. And he was speaking his mind and ran into troubles. They uh, locked him up in a, in a psychic ward for a while. Uh, then they uh, didn't let him work whenever he found a job. The next day they told him, sorry, we cannot give you that job. So the family was hungry. And then they threatened to send him to Goliotok, which was the prisoner's island, for the, the island for political prisoners. 
And the only way out was then leaving the country. And since my mom was half Austrian herself, Austria was a natural choice. Our countries have always been very close together and we have lots of relations until today. And you mentioned it uh, yourself that freedom of speech is something that we have to value very high. And sometimes it is forgotten. That Absolutely. freedom of speech is not something that uh, is available for many, for millions of people in the world. And uh, we should really appreciate that we have the freedom of speech, mind and also of, of thinking. And this is something I would like to mention, especially in the light uh, that we have so many multiple crises at the moment that we have to deal with. Just uh, as a short reminder, Afghanistan, the situation there is really tragic, especially for women, but not only for women. The whole Middle East, uh, many countries in Africa, so this is something that will be Ukraine. the Ukraine, of course. We come to the Ukraine anyway. So Austria is very proud because you joined our board. You are a board member of Care Austria uh, quite recently. And we are very proud uh, that you will work with us in the future. And as I mentioned, you're an expert for uh, refugees and refugee issues. And uh, in that role, you published in 2021 a very interesting book. The German title is Die von Europa Träumen, Dreaming of Europe, more or less. And this book deals with uh, the politically and emotionally uh, charged topic of migration and flight to Europe. And what is quite unusual and what is really interesting and also very touching is that Milita Sunic let the people affected tell their real stories. This is, these are no invented histories. These are real life stories. And she has recorded hundreds of, of conversations with refugees from all regions, from Africa, the Middle East, from Asia. So she's a quite experienced interviewer of people migrating. And as this whole debate is very emotionally loaded, I suggest that we take the most common assumptions and start our conversation around those. So the first assumption that I would like to put on the table is millions of people are just waiting to literally flood Europe. What is your take on that? Well, um, let's go back to history. I, uh, I remember when uh, communist, the communist system broke down and the borders were open toward Austria's eastern neighbors. A, an Austrian newspaper said that tens of tens of millions of of people are now will now flood Austria and the rest of Europe because they all they want is to come to Europe. It never happened. Uh, people do not per se want to leave their country unless they have a reason, and we rarely look at the reasons. Also in migration policy, we look at how we can get rid of the people, not how we can get rid of the problem. Because if you have mass emigration from a country, then the country has a problem. Either it's human rights violations and war, then they become refugees, or it's massive economic problems, then they become economic migrants. So for me, the first step would be to look at the reasons, at the root causes, and then uh, take it from there. Number one. Number two, what I can also say is if you look, uh, a lot is written about the African migration and the African immigration to Europe. If you look at the real figures, most of the people coming in an irregular way to Europe are not from Africa. They are coming from, from Afghanistan. They are coming from Syria. They're coming from other countries, um, or other continents, in fact. Uh, and the African immigration is very small. The largest part of African migration takes place within Africa. And uh, by the way, the largest part of, of, of Afghan or Syrian migration takes also place in the region. We only think that Europe is the one and only destination for these people. This is what we think about uh, the people migranting globally, but... Uh, 
at that time, it, I think it makes sense to look a little bit at, at the numbers because globally the richest regions in the world, the US and the European Union, host only 15% of global refugee uh, movement and so-called developing countries host 85% of migrating people. So we have you you listed the top five in your book. Um, so let's have a look at it. It's number one is Turkey. That's not a big surprise for us, hosting around 3.6 million people. Number two, Colombia in South America, hosting 1.8 million. And then it becomes very interesting because then it's Pakistan and Uganda ex equo, 1.4 million each. And in this ranking of the top five, only the last place, number five, is a European country, which is Germany, with 1.1 million people. So I would say this is a myth that is used politically and also from some stakeholders to create the idea that we are flooded. So I think we have discussed the first assumption. Let's look at another one. Uh, that is heard very, very often, especially in the Austrian context, but not only, I assume, people, migranting people, will be sustained by our welfare system for years. And you have in your book a very uh, interesting, uh, interesting conclusion. You say that some branches of industry, they wouldn't work anymore without the help of migrant workers and people coming to our country seeking work? Uh, we see all over Europe, we have a demographic deficit now that the baby boomer generation is retiring. Wherever you go, highly qualified, less qualified, menial work, we do not have enough people. And I remember uh, a few months ago, last March, April, when the first Ukrainian refugees started to arrive in Austria, a lot of people were happy that they were coming and they said, oh, wonderful, we have these people, they can start working. And then it turned out that many of them just transited Austria, like, by the way, many of the irregular migrants from elsewhere also just transit Austria. And then everybody was sort of... Uh, disappointed and said, why are they moving on? Why can't they stay? So we have a problem. We need people. Uh, and this is this hypocrisy when discussing migration, that on the one hand, uh, we need immigration. Great Britain is, is now um, seeing the results of Brexit and seeing the results of barring immigration into the country. They don't have people for buses. They don't have people for the health system. They don't have teachers. Uh, they don't have enough people in, in, in agricultural, in the agricultural sector. So we, uh, this is, serves as a, as a proof that we need people. We need an exchange and exchange and migration to some extent is normal, but it should be regulated because it will spare us a lot of, of unnecessary bureaucracy. And it would spare those people years and years of sitting idle in asylum procedures that take really several years and that they destroy people and their psyche. And, and very often ends in a big frustration and, and disappointment because I remember uh, many people in your book who are talking about having fled for more than five or seven years. And even if they want to go back, in many cases, people then when they see how difficult it is and when they lose a lot of money and they lose this, their strength and when they strand somewhere at the border, they say, I would go back, but I can't because I spent so much money for the smugglers that helped me and my family provided the funding for it. And now I can't go back with empty hands. Isn't that also really a tragic part of the whole discussion that we oversee the damage that, that thousands of human beings have to suffer from just because there is not a better accessible asylum process here in the European Union? Uh, absolutely. That's the paradox that the only people really benefiting from the system we have now are the smugglers. Everybody else is paying either 
with their lives and with years of suffering, like the, the people who are trying to come in an irregular manner. But also the system we have now in Europe is extremely, extremely expensive. We have 27 asylum systems, 27 procedures. In each country, we need the staff, we need the accommodations. Long processes are taking place. And what is more, at the maximum all over Europe, one third of the people have some kind, get in the end, get some kind of protection status. That means two thirds of the people applying for asylum never belonged into this very, very expensive asylum system. They belonged elsewhere. But Europe does not have, unlike, for instance, the US or Canada or Australia, these typical immigration countries, Europe doesn't see itself as an immigration continent, which is not true. Phenomena. And they uh, and they don't have a, a functioning labor immigration system. We see that now, uh, currently, with people from India migrating to Europe, looking for work, and they all end up in our asylum system because there is simply no system for a work permission for Indians who would like to work in Europe. It's even more paradoxical. It depends from country to country. Indians, there are websites, uh, Czech websites in India, inviting Indians to come and look for work in the Czech Republic. A lot of agricultural workers in Italy are from India. Mm -hmm. So these people look, how can I get there? And they find out the cheapest Uh, an easiest way would be to fly to Belgrade because until mm -hmm. the end of last year they could uh, visa. enter without visa exactly, and then they traveled the short uh, the short part mm -hmm. to to through Austria either to Italy or to uh, mm -hmm. Germany, and then when they are held up in Austria, they only have the choice to be sent away uh, sent back immediately. Or to ask for asylum. Yes. What do they do? They ask for asylum and then they leave a few days later. That's a paradox. It is a paradox, I, mm -hmm. absolutely. So we talk about the cheapest way to reach. So for India, this might uh, apply, but the smugglers, as you mentioned, I have heard that from Afghanistan, they take from Afghanistan to Europe. So I want to make sure whether this is possible, that that might cost you up to 15,000 euro. Have you heard about that? Yes, ten, it was. It used to be ten, then it came up to twelve. Now we have fifteen thousand dollars or euro, yeah. which is it's more or less the, the same. same. And um, what what the fathers do? They want to get their sons out of harm's way on the one hand, also, and they want to have maybe a son in Europe who can provide, who has mm -hmm. a job. So what they do is they sell land. These are farmers. It's a farming country. They sell land, or what is worse they sell a little girl mm -hmm. into Don't marriage just, mm -hmm. yeah because um because if you marry in afghanistan you have to pay for your bride mm -hmm. and they use this bride money to to send their sons to europe and unfortunately the younger the bride the the higher the price yeah. i mean 15000 euro also is a lot of money absolutely in even europe. for us for us that's what i wanted to say so it's really incredible what smugglers press out of people who are really uh, desperate and only looking for a better life, because that's what it's all about, looking for some better life. And if I understood you correctly, and in my opinion, we will need migrants to sustain our welfare system in the future because we need people who work on a regular basis and to help us support our own systems. We absolutely do, because the European population is getting older, which means fewer children, which means that it's dwindling. The numbers are dwindling. Uh, and the, the countries that used to provide manpower woman power mm -hmm. to Western Europe, like say Poland mm -hmm. or like Romania mm -hmm. have, um, have an emigration problem by now. They mm -hmm. are missing people. They 5%, I think, or four or 5% of the Polish population is outside. Uh, Romania lost 3 million people. Mm -hmm. So they now have immigration programs from other countries again, and from outside Europe to fill up this, this deficit 
So instead of having such haphazard ways of regulating migration, it should be an overall master plan behind it, how we deal with the people in a dignified way, how we help the European economy and the European welfare system, and how we do not exploit those people. Mm -hmm. I think this is this is really a valuable input, and I hope that many uh, political stakeholders also listen to what you are saying and also what you are writing in your book. And from the experience of care, uh, we see that uh, there is a sort of because we are doing the thing that is always claimed in the official Austria, we help the people in the region where they belong to. Because as you said right in the beginning, you know nobody who wants to leave home and become a refugee. That's the worst thing, I think. One of the worst thing, things that you might experience as a human being. So if we assume that Europe is a bit afraid of looking at itself as a migrant as an attractive continent for immigration. We refuse that, yeah? Um, has this maybe to do something with the assumption that integration is so difficult coming from an outside European culture? It's so difficult to integrate and therefore we are reluctant to welcome people in Europe. What would you say? Well, a lot of countries do have integration problems, and one of one of the issues is that uh, it was ignored for a long time uh, from the one side and uh, from the more liberal parties, and it was being uh, augmented and 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 blown out of proportion from the other side. What we need is fact based activities when it comes to migration and also when it comes to integration. And um, integration policies could be better, but a very typical example. People who, uh, asylum seekers, instead of putting them in small units, in small towns, in villages, where they get to know the people, where they get to know the Austrians, uh, also where the Austrians can help them um, no, Acculturate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this is this is a very rare solution. Mostly, they put big uh, big asylum homes somewhere, and then these people sit around idle. They have nothing to do. They're bored. Sometimes, of course, young people who have no money, who have nothing to do, young men have very weird ideas about how to go about their lives. They fall prey to criminals who say, why don't you sell drugs? You can make some money and so on. And the, 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 the population, and it's not only an Austrian problem, what the population sees is people who are doing nothing. So they say, of my taxpayers' money, they have a great life. On the other hand, these people want nothing else but a job and a real life. Because living in an asylum um, home is like uh, living, uh, like you put your, your um, life on pause, on hold, mm -hmm. And wait for it to resume. So uh, there is a lot of systemic problems that the migration policy creates. And then we blame the migrants for it. But they are victims of this policy. Mm -hmm. And the average duration of an asylum process is years, right? It's three years. to five years. Depends on the country in Europe, depends also on where you come from. But I have met people who have been waiting for seven years. Oh, even worse. And without permission to work, to work properly, mm -hmm. uh, the access f to education is not open for everybody, of course, or to quality education. Mm -hmm. So desperation grows. And uh, I remember many people who said, okay, when I started my journey, I was 16. Now I'm 24 mm -hmm. and I have nothing in my hands. So this is really, and I think it's also, if we stay like that in Europe, if we stick to that system, if we cling to letting people wait and hang around, as you correctly said, for years, it would be very difficult for them, even if they are granted asylum in the end. Yes, because to we restart know. Yeah. their life. You know that you can de-learn your skills 
mm-hmm. not learn being being self self sufficient. Mm-hmm. I remember I once visited a, a, a refugee project in Ireland. Uh, they had an old. Um, it was a village, like a vacation village in the in the seventies and eighties, which was not used anymore. So they had little houses in a nice park, very nice environment, where they put those refugees, and they had a great life. They're far from a city and everything, but they had everything they needed. But once they came out into the real world, they just didn't understand that you have to pay for electricity, for the flat, for things that your child needs at school, for your clothes, because they had been kept in this, in this environment of, of, of being cared for. Mm-hmm. So for too long. For much mm-hmm. too long. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is something that it is rather complex, but I think it gets a bit less complex if we could accept that people, what people need. And it's the same. These are the same things nearly that we, all of us are needing and we are all taking it for granted that we have access to everything and everything is clear for us. So I think that the civil society does a lot more than is visible and helps a lot many refugees. And I think that many institutions uh, are a bit left alone with with the whole problem. And what I also see is that many wrong assumptions circle around in the whole discussion. And these assumptions fuel the those people who are afraid for their own good life. And this creates this creates a lot of tension that is unnecessary. And I really hope that uh, organizations like UNHCR and of course also organizations like Care International can help lower the level of being afraid from uh, people migranting, uh, provide a better understanding of the of the whole uh, situation and also motivate people to support and help each other, even if this is uh, maybe for many a naive approach, but this is something that works at least, that we help and support each other. I, I would like to ask you more or less a final question as a European citizen, because you have really good suggestions and ideas how Europe could handle uh, the whole asylum system more effective. You have recommendations, so are you not, you're not only describing the whole situation, but in your expertise, you really suggest, you call it the seven theses for European migration policy. And when I read them, I would, I would sign them off all. But do you think it's realistic that European countries and European politicians, as engaged as they might be, are able to agree to that and make life easier for all of us in the end? Um, I don't say that my seven theses are the best, but but mostly they correlate with what other migration experts say. But we all together, not only me, other experts as well, we keep meeting at round tables and we look at each other and just nod our heads and say, yeah, it's Groundhog Day again. Because what we hear is always the same arguments from the same parties. It's such a, an emotionalized, politicized issue where everybody sticks to their views. And I think if we don't, uh, if we are not able to step out of the box and to look at the problem from a different angle, we will not find solutions. I think it was Einstein who said, stupidity is when you keep doing the same thing and expecting other results. Mm -hmm. And this is in a way what Europe, and and not only at the European level, but what the European governments keep doing. They try solutions for which we know they didn't work, like um, um, more and more uh, border controls, like trying to to establish um, asylum processing centers externally outside of Europe, things like that. We saw that they didn't work and still we, uh, many politicians are giving the same answers. Unless we get out of the box, unless we look at this problem from a holistic way and from a different angle, we will have Groundhog Day 
on and on again. Mm -hmm. I think that the centers at the European borders, uh, I think that many Europeans don't have a clue what such a center looks like and how life looks like because it does not match our high standards of human rights or of humanity, which Europe praises itself a lot for. And I think we should all be proud of that. But what happens at the borders uh, of the European Union is really disgusting. I can't say it differently. And as CARE, we all also cooperate with uh, our organization in the Balkans. And as CARE Austria, we provide uh, continuously funding for the refugee camps uh, in Bosnia. And it's not about having a nice uh, life uh, on the basis of any welfare state. It is only surviving on the minimum that you need. Yeah. So Melita Sunic, uh, thank you for this conversation. My again, pleasure. We are proud to have you at CARE. Welcome again. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. This was Care in Action, the podcast of Care Austria with Andrea Barstorf Hager. For further information, go to care.at. Sponsored by CC Real.